Explore new ideas and new worlds here on Arizona PBS, a community service of Arizona State University. Arizona PBS programming is brought to you in part by the underwriting support of local businesses. Learn how you can support Arizona PBS and grow your own business by reaching viewers like you. Call 602-496-8664 or azpbs.org slash underwriting. Coming up next on Arizona PBS, life and world. Michael Crow here, president of Arizona State University. I just want to say thank you to all of our PBS viewers. You all are taking the time to keep yourself up to date. You're taking the time to keep yourself active in learning. You're using the network and the university as a learning platform to advance your family. I think that's the way that everything's going to be moving in the future. And so we're really excited. And I just want to say thank you for watching Arizona PBS. Coming soon to Arizona PBS. Next time on Call the Midwife. Everything is just a bit too much for your wife at the moment. She's going nowhere. Fit for a queen. You've just got to find entrance. Ivy Lanta. She loves you almost as much as I do, Trixie. Oh dear. These young girls are offerings to the fertility gods. So as much a part of her as her eye colour or the size of her feet. There's no treatment for it. Sunday night at 7 on Arizona PBS. This week on Me Too, Now What? A cultural reckoning, social media, advertising, music. It's entertainment to a certain extent. Objectifying women or celebrating sexuality. Images that we're seeing in the gaming world are always of a hypersexualized female. We give her very big red lips and her open mouth and those bedroom eyes, and we don't show any of those traits on the male characters at all. Friday night at 7.30 on Arizona PBS. From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. March 31st is Cesar Chavez Day, a time to celebrate the civil rights activists, but some are proposing to change today's meaning. Arizona teachers and students are demanding more action, money, and support from our government. Plus, the Amber Alert system could soon be available on native lands. Find out how one mother's tragic loss inspired her to advocate for change. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Gabriel Gamino. And I'm Nicole Costantino. Thank you for joining us. Says that Chavez's birthday is only two days away and people in the valley are already celebrating his legacy. However, a recently proposed change to the name of the holiday has garnered strong reactions. Cronkite News reporter Alexis Burdine has more. Cesar Chavez Leadership Academy was filled with music, color, and dancing as students, along with teachers and staff, celebrated the civil rights activists. The colorful event happened today at the center in Phoenix, honoring the man who the school is named after. But there was also talk about a much more serious issue brought to the table regarding the Chavez holiday. If we are calling something um, a border wall day, we are not talking about unifying and we're not talking about bringing people together. We're talking about doing the opposite of that. On March 20th, Texas Representative Republican Louis Gohmert submitted a proposal to change Cesar Chavez Day to National Border Control Day. I think that it's offensive. I think it's unnecessary and I question the motivation behind it. In a press release, Gomert said, quote, it only seems appropriate to deem his birthday as National Border Control Day, seeing that Chavez spent his life addressing the harmful effects that illegal migration might have. His proposal has faced a huge amount of backlash on social media, including that from his colleague, Democrat and California Representative Mark Takano, who tweeted that Gomert should apologize. Today is a day that many Latinos are very proud um, to celebrate. Um, on behalf of Cesar Chavez, and we will fight to keep it Cesar Chavez Day. Chavez was opposed to undocumented immigration, but he is best known for his fight to help Latino farm workers and unify communities. And that is what those at the event are honoring today. I think it has a negative connotation to it because nobody wants to hear about border. It's not, it's not about that, I guess. You know, it's about 
what he did. Students like Miranda say it's about remembering the man behind their school's name who sought to protect and improve the lives of minority farm workers through peaceful organization and togetherness. In Phoenix, Alexis Berdine, Cronkite News. This is not the first time that Gomert has faced public backlash. M many people were outraged in 2010 when he warned of a conspiracy theory called terror babies, which suggested that U.S. babies were being taken to be raised outside of the country by terrorist cells. Red for Red brought together Arizona teachers and education advocates who are fighting for more resources in the state. Reporter Emily Richardson attended the rally where the organizers demanded action from state lawmakers. There won't be any more teachers here and then we the kids won't have any education but their parents to educate them who don't really know that much. Hannah Meyer came to the Red for Red rally to show support for teachers and she was joined by thousands of Arizonans who came to express the importance of education. Save Our Schools, Arizona Educators United and the Arizona PTA organized this event to demand action from state lawmakers and Governor Doug Ducey. What's the plan, Ducey? What's the plan? Their demands included no new tax cuts until education funding is restored to 2008 levels competitive pay and annual raises for teachers, and lastly, a 20% pay increase for all educators. We received a statement from Governor Doug Ducey's office, which reads in part, Governor Ducey believes teachers are the biggest difference makers out there. They do extraordinary work each day, and they should be valued and rewarded for their hard work. More needs to be done, but Arizona has made progress. The governor's goal is to pass a budget in the next few weeks that continues to increase our investment in public education, but we won't stop there. We will continue each year to put more resources into K-12 through education to better serve our teachers and students. The teachers say they do not want to strike, but if their demands are not met, they will. We will do everything in our power to avoid a strike. This is because as educators, we know that we are willing to put kids first even when the state won't. I wouldn't be able to go to school and I might not get the best education. The teachers say they have put up with too much for too long, but more importantly, their students deserve better. In Phoenix, Emily Richardson, Cronkite News. A 20% pay increase could cost the state about $680 million. Restoring education funding to 2008 levels would mean that the state needs to invest nearly $1 billion more annually. Arizona spends about $924 less per student today than in 2008. The organizations behind the event say educators have been neglected for too long and they will continue to make themselves heard until something is changed. The Amber Alert system helps recover hundreds of children every year in the United States. However, that system isn't available to Native Americans living on reservation lands, but that could be changing soon. I spoke with one mother who's advocating for this change, and she says it could have saved her daughter's life. It's been a nightmare, and it still is every night. I go to bed, you know, hoping to see her and I wake up and my nightmare starts all over again. Pamela Foster may never stop grieving after the kidnapping and murder of her daughter. Back in May 2016, 11-year-old Ashlyn Mike and her brother were abducted in the Navajo Nation of New Mexico. 29-year-old Tom Begay Jr. lured the children into his car and drove them out to the desert, where Ashlyn was sexually assaulted, beaten, and left to die. Her brother was let go. It's still hard. The pain is very much alive. Amber Alerts don't reach tribal lands, and because they were on Native American reservation, it took hours for an Amber Alert to be sent out. By the time it was, her body had already been found. It's the worst feeling that you can have as a parent to know that your, tr your child is missing and you have no way to find them. But despite this tragedy, Ashland's family turned their sorrow into action, advocating for Amber Alerts in Indian Country. After 18 months, the family is just one signature away the president's. Arizona Senator John McCain and Representative Andy Biggs are behind the Ashland Mike Amber Alert and Indian Country Act, a bill that would bring the Amber Alert system to all tribal lands across the United States, something Navajo Nation Council Delegate Amber Kanesbaugh Crotty says can be the difference between life and death. Every minute counts. And so when a child is taken, we want every valuable minute to be used to, to find that child and to let um, our community know that, that there has been a Navajo child abducted. 
I will never get over the loss and I don't want another parent to experience what I have. Representative Biggs said the bill was unanimously passed by the House and Senate. They expect President Trump to sign the bill any day now. Ashland's killer was convicted back in October of last year and is now serving a life sentence in federal prison. Just last year, the Trump administration declared March 29th as National Vietnam War Veterans Day. Today, veterans are honored for their service and sacrifice across the country. 45 years ago today, the last American troops were sent home from Vietnam since 2010. Arizona has celebrated Vietnam Veterans Day to recognize those who have served. Today's ceremony not only brought together members of the veteran community, but recognized them for their dedication to our nation. Today, Arizona is reminded that our veterans have given us a gift we can never truly repay. And as a grateful state, we remain committed to showing our veterans that we value their service, not only with our words, but with actions. The day was also observed in Washington, D.C., where officials held a wreath-laying ceremony at the, veteran, at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. As a small crowd looked on, 15 Vietnam veterans, also surviving family members, were given commemorative pins to honor the occasion by the Deputy Secretaries of Veteran Affairs, Homeland Security, and the Department of Defense. Drowning is the third most common cause of unintentional injury-related deaths in Arizona, according to the Arizona Department of Health Services. Coming up on Cronkite News, how the Phoenix Fire Department and Valley Hotels are working together to teach parents and children water safety. Plus, we all know texting and driving is dangerous, but what about texting and walking? One city is banning people from doing just that. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wickerburg. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. So far this year, there have been four incidents involving child drownings. Reporter Sydney Eisenberg shows us how the Phoenix Fire Department used a drowning drill to teach parents that water safety isn't just a summertime issue. Transport the child to the hospital. We have For some reason, children are just attracted to water, and it, it, these drownings happen throughout the year. The Phoenix Fire Department hosted a drowning drill to show parents that water safety shouldn't be used just in the summertime. Uh, you know, we pulled the child out of the pool. A bystander performed good bystander CPR. Somebody made quick access to 911, and then our crews got there and started CPR from that point. Firefighters handed out these water safety checklists that focus on the ABCs of water safety, adult supervision, barriers, and classes. With adequate adult supervision um, and, and really people being vigilant to what's going on and being aware of their surroundings, you know, these are 100 percent um, preventable accidents. Johnson Mathai is the director of safety and security for the Point Hilton Tapatio Cliffs Resort. He invited the department to use the hotel for a water safety drill almost 20 years ago after hearing about so many drownings in the valley. He says that while all three parts of the ABCs are important for water safety, the most important aspect is adult supervision. It's not a child's fault. It's, it's the adult supervision that, that causes 
or lack of that causes it. We do watch, but without their sense of urgency, it's, it becomes very difficult. In Phoenix, Sydney Eisenberg, Cronkite News. According to the Arizona Department of Health Services, in 2014, there were 91 serious water-related incidents that occurred in Maricopa County. Of those 91 incidents, 43 of them were involved children between ages 0 and 4 years old. Residents who experienced increased flight noise in their neighborhoods since 2014 will have some quiet starting today. The Federal Aviation Administration is reverting old routes for many flights departing from Sky Harbor going west. The FAA says the route change implements an agreement between the agency, the city, and the residents in the area. According to the Governor's Highway Safety Association, Arizona, Delaware, and Florida have the highest rates of pedestrian deaths in the country. But other states are now stepping up, trying to curb this deadly problem. Cronkite News reporter Brooke DeGumbia visited one city in California that is taking action to protect its citizens from the dangers of texting and crossing. People on streets and sidewalks everywhere are multitasking. Headphones in, looking down at their phones, even while crossing the street, and not exactly paying attention to their surroundings. I feel like I can walk across the street and text and not that big of a deal. Montclair, California is one of three U.S. cities that have enacted a law banning the use of mobile devices while crossing the street. As more people are walking and using their phones, Montclair has chosen to take action on this growing issue. John Hamilton wrote the ordinance that was put in place on January 3rd. People nowadays that are distracted, they're looking at their phones, they are engaged in a game, in texting and social media. Since the law went into effect, the chief of police noted they've come in contact with residents from 14 all the way up to 51 years old, engaging in distracted walking. We don't want to have to respond to traffic collisions involving vehicles and pedestrians. Uh, usually the pedestrian loses. Distracted walking fatalities increased 22% from 2014 to 2016. It's one of those things that while I find it easy to look at others and say that's not the right thing to do you realize that it sort of the impulse to always be connected is so strong that it's, it's very easy to text and walk left or right Republican or Democrat I think what people really recognize is that this law is intended to protect people. Those who are caught crossing and texting are now being given a warning. But starting August 1st, a fine of $100 will be issued to first-time offenders. This LA resident believes the new law could help in creating a better community among residents. Maybe they'll look up and like interact with each other rather than just sitting on their phone, acting like they have like important stuff to do. This law just prevents one person from being struck and being seriously injured or killed, then the law has worked. In Los Angeles, Brooke DeGumbia, Cronkite News. Honolulu, Hawaii and Rexburg, Idaho are the two other cities currently with this type of law in place. As pedestrian fatalities continue to rise across the country, other cities are looking to potentially implement a ban on their streets as well. The solar industry has seen a downturn in jobs nationally, but employment is rising here in the Valley of the Sun. Coming up on Cronkite News, we talk to experts about how tariffs could affect the growth of solar jobs. And it's officially baseball season. Coming up, I've got your opening day forecast. I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. Join us each weekday at 5.30 and 10 as we bring you the top newsmakers who impact the state. We cover the stories in depth that shape and affect our local communities, and we take the time to ensure that all voices are equally heard. For more than 30 years, Arizona Horizon has been your voice and your source for what matters most, right here on Arizona PBS. Fridays, it's at Cronkite News, your social sharing connection where you choose the news. Facebook likes and shares, tweets, retweets, and favorites. YouTube views and subscriptions. We're watching you watch us. From our digital home at cronkitenews.azpbs.org to your television, web browser, or mobile device. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Then join us for At Cronkite News, our weekly refresh, each Friday at 5 on Arizona PBS. 
Almost half of Arizona is in extreme drought and local businesses are feeling the heat in the valley. However, there is a temporary solution. Plant nurseries, agricultural co-ops and nonprofits that have suffered agricultural loss due to drought can apply for a low interest disaster loan through, through November 8th of this year. The loan has a maximum term of 30 years. Businesses dependent on farmers and ranchers effect, affected can also apply. U.S. solar jobs fell last year for the first time since 2010, according to an annual survey of solar jobs released this week. But experts say the drop follows a sharp increase in 2016, and many states, including Arizona, saw continued job growth in 2017. As Shelby Lindsay reports from our Washington Bureau. Ed Gilliland, senior director of the Solar Foundation, said last year's nearly 3.8% drop in solar jobs was not a surprise after a boom in business in 2016. A lot of the firms were trying to get the solar installed in 2016 because they assumed that that was going to be the last year of the federal investment tax credit. But that tax credit wound up being extended. But Gilliland said Arizona was helped because it still had net metering for much of 2017 allowing homeowners to sell surplus power back to their utilities. The state, of course, uh, uh, was enacting, getting, doing away with net metering, um, which is uh, very important to solar growth. The census said Arizona ranked third for solar job growth in 2017. But Brandon Cheshire, president of the Arizona Solar Energy Industry Association, said the numbers are not so bright over the long term. I mean, what I've seen since 2005 is the state's lost 2,500 jobs. Gilliland stands by the census, but he said the Trump administration's decision to impose a tariff on imported solar cells makes the future a little cloudier. We're, see we're seeing an increase in prices, and so that will add some headwinds to the industry. Um, nevertheless, we are seeing uh, it's very important what goes on in the individual states. In Washington, Shelby Lindsay, Cronkite News. No shortage of sunshine for Arizona as we head into this holiday weekend. No, not at all. We've seen plenty of sunshine with little cloud cover as we can see in this radar right here. Just a little bit of clouds to the southern part of our state, which is a great thing because today's opening day. So it's going to have a great temperature for your opening day for that first pitch starting at 7 10 p.m. versus the Rockies tonight. If you're heading downtown, going to be clear skies and quite the nice evening as we head into that evening we are going to be seeing our lows dip into the high 50s and low set low 60s for the week and then as we turn into our highs tomorrow we are going to be warming back up we have 85 degrees in phoenix down in south in tucson at 82 and then up in flagstaff and the grand canyon we're going to be at about 61 and 62 degrees there as well for our seven day forecast headed into our weekend if you're celebrating it is going to be a toasty one with highs in the low 90s and as we break out into our work week. We are going to be seeing those 90s uh, stay pretty steady, but we're going to keep it low at 92 as we head into the rest of the week. And Chase Field is about to fill up with thousands of baseball fans for the start of a new season. And opening day for Major League Baseball is sliding into Arizona, but some changes at Chase may affect how the game is played. Cronkite News weeknights at 5 on Arizona PBS. By the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Before Professor Halden, I had an insane amount of passion, but I almost felt helpless because I didn't know how to use it. Professor Halden gave me a chance to make a difference. Being at a place like ASU allows you to take these big leaps Ultimately, the biggest problems in the world cannot be solved alone. Third Rail with Ozzy. The new weekly show where we tackle the taboo and debate the tough questions with some of the most interesting minds in the game. I'm Carlos Watson, electrifying conversation.
Friday, only on PBS. Three former Phoenix Suns will be inducted into the 2018 Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. Steve Nash, Grant Hill, and Jason Kidd all spent part of their careers here in Phoenix. Nash was inducted into the Phoenix Suns Ring of Honor in October 2015 and won two MVP awards while in the Valley. These three players are the first former Suns to be inducted to the Hall of Fame since Shaquille O'Neal was inducted in 2016. Opening day for Major League Baseball is swinging across the nation and here in Arizona today. Chase Field features a new addition to the ballpark that fans will never see, but could have a significant impact on the game. Cronkite News reporter Blaine McCormick is just a few blocks away from our Cronkite News studios at Chase Field with more. Blaine? And thank you, Nicole. Today, the Arizona Diamondbacks will open their season against the Colorado Rockies at 710. But this season will have a trace of humidity. But I'm not talking about the weather. Earlier this season, the Diamondbacks announced that their baseballs will now be stored in an on-site humidor. You can definitely tell a difference in the ball, and I'm sure, you know, scientifically speaking, there are some advantages, and it does slow the ball down a little bit. But um, when you're facing the Rockies, when you're facing the D-backs, at both places, you know, you got to make good pitches. In the 20 seasons since the Diamondbacks entered Major League Baseball in 1998, Chase Field has seen an average of 170 home runs per season per baseball reference, fifth among the 15 teams in the National League. Dr. Alan Nathan, a physics professor emeritus at the University of Illinois and one of the leading experts on humidors in baseball, says the new equipment at Chase is all about reducing the bounciness of the ball or in scientific terms, the coefficient of restitution. That coefficient of restitution plays an important role in the collision between the ball and the bat. The larger it is, the faster the ball comes off the bat. Imagine hitting a super ball, okay? Uh, as opposed to when it's lower, the ball doesn't come off the bat quite as fast. So it plays a role in the so-called exit speed of the ball from the bat. Nathan went on to say that he expects the humidor will help reduce the number of home runs at Chase Field. The only other ballpark in Major League Baseball with a humidor is Coors Field in Denver. Nathan said home runs there went down 25% after the Rockies installed their humidor in 2002. Diamondbacks first baseman Paul Goldschmidt said the fact baseballs at Chase now will come out of a humidor will not affect his approach at the plate. As a player, you know, all that's out of your control. You're just trying to see the ball hit the ball and, you know, if it goes out or if it gets in the gap or it's a hit, then great. And if they catch it, then that's fine. I don't think anyone's going to be changing, you know, what they do. If it affects it, it's going to affect it for both teams. Now, even though this is the first regular season contest where the Diamondbacks will be using the baseballs, they used them in a couple of exhibition matches earlier this week. Live at Chase Field, Blaine McCormick, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up next on Arizona Horizon and the PBS News Hour. On the next Arizona Horizon, Congressman Raul Grijalva will join us in studio and a one-on-one -on -one interview with Luis Gonzalez as the Diamondbacks' regular season begins. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, how sneakers are big money. Part two of our look at the economic power of shoes. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Coming up on Arizona Collectibles. This watch probably has over a hundred moving parts to it. She put this on her one dollar table. Oh, wow. Nobody would. Tonight at 7.30 on Arizona PBS. Explore new ideas and new worlds here on Arizona PBS. A community service of Arizona State University.
The easiest and best way to support Arizona PBS is by becoming a sustaining member. Your monthly contribution of $5 or more comes directly from your bank account or credit card, so you know your membership is always current. It also means no more renewal notices in your mailbox. So more of your dollars go to the programs you love. It's convenient for you, greener for us, and better for the planet. Become a sustaining member today. Coming up next on Arizona PBS, life and world. Hello, I'm Paula Kerger, President and CEO of PBS. We know that you have many choices on TV, and I just want to say thank you for choosing to watch Arizona PBS. In addition to offering the best of our national content, from the PBS NewsHour to PBS Kids, your station presents exceptional programs that focus on the issues important to your family and your community. As we look to the future, we promise that we will continue to offer content that educates, inspires, and entertains. Thank you so much for your support of Arizona PBS. Coming soon to Arizona PBS. The west coast of Ireland is still pretty wild. Almost seems otherworldly. What could get better than this? Friday night at 8 on Arizona PBS. Hi, I'm Alberto Rios. This week on Books and Company, Cory Doctorow talking about his latest book, The Walkaway. But this is not a heavy book. Mm -hmm. This is a book about people in mecha suits fighting Zeppelins with rail guns. Don't miss Books and Company Friday night at 11:30 on Arizona PBS. When you want to be more informed, Arizona PBS delivers news and analysis with multiple perspectives, thanks to financial support from you and Hospice of the Valley, medical, social, and spiritual care for patients nearing end of life. 